Good afternoon, it's Pastor Laura Terry and I'm come to you today to do another journey through the scripture. Today we are looking at Daniel 6, uh, 6 through 24. We're looking at the story of Daniel and the lion's dead. So here now the scripture from Daniel 6, 6 through 24. So the presidents and the satraps conspired and came to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an edict that whoever prays to anyone, divine or human, for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into a den of lions. Now, O king, establish the inter interdict and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and interdict. Daniel in the lion's den. Although Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he continued to go to his house, which had windows in its upper room uh, toward Jerusalem, and to get down on his knees three times a day to pray to his God and praise him, just as he had done previously. The conspirators came and found Daniel praying and seeking mercy from his God. Then they approached the king and said, concerning the interdict, O Lord, did you not sign a, an interdict that anyone who prays to anyone, divine or human, within 30 days except for you, O king, shall be thrown into a den of lions? And the king answered, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they responded to the king, Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the interdict that, that you have signed, but he is saying his prayers three times a day. When the king heard the charge, he was very much distressed. He was determined to save Daniel until the sun went down. He made every effort to rescue him. Then the conspirators came to the king and said to him, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no interdict or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king gave the command, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. A stone was brought and laid at the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lord's so that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No food was brought to him and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day, the king got up and hurried to the den of lions. When he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out anxiously to Daniel. O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you faithfully serve been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel then said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they would not hurt me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no wrong. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in God. The king gave a command and those who had accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the den of lions, they, their children and their wives. Before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones into pieces. This is the reading of God's word, thanks be to God. Well, Daniel, Daniel was of a royal race and he, it, it, he, what is even far better is he had royal character as well. Daniel is depicted in the pages of scripture as one of the greatest and most faultless of men. Daniel is a noble Jewish youth of Jerusalem who was taken into captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar of, of Babylon. And we first meet him when he's but a very young man as he is introduced to Nebuchadnezzar. The Chaldeans and magicians and astrologers had all failed to divine the secret which perplexed the king and troubled his spirit, till at length there stood up before him uh, the young prince of the house of Judah to interpret his dream. Now in these days after he showed, showed his dauntless courage when he interpreted the memorable dream of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel became a lion-like uh, a lion-like man to say to the king, Thou, O king, shall be driven from among men and eat grass like an oxen, and thy body shall be wet with the dew of heaven, till thy, 
hair grows like eagle's feathers and thy nails like bird's claws. Everything Daniel told the king came true for Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel interpreted the dreams truthfully with a clear conscience. Daniel comes forth again, though, in the book of Daniel on the last night of Belshazzar's reign, when the power of Babylon is coming to, get to an end and is broken forever. The Persians had dried up the river and were already at the palace's doorstep. Thou art weighed in the balance and art found waiting, Daniel tells them, as, uh, as he points to the mysterious handwriting on the wall. After this, he appears again, and this time it is a personal dilemma that brings him to the forefront. This morning, or this, this afternoon, uh, as we're looking at the prophet Daniel, he is probably facing the greatest test of his lifetime. Daniel is now serving under a new king by the name of King Darius. The king, this king, like all the ones before him, recognized that Daniel had a lot of integrity, and he recognized that Daniel was a very wise man. Daniel was almost 90 years old at this point in our scripture, and Darius chose Daniel to be one of three men who would run his, his kingdom. Daniel did such a good job for Darius that he got rid of the other two, and he placed Daniel in charge of the whole entire government. And as you can imagine, this didn't go over very well with the other gentlemen. It, it, they became jealous and, and they decided that they were going to try and figure out and dig up some dirt on Daniel. The problem was that they couldn't find any dirt on Daniel. And they knew Daniel was a very religious man and so they tried to use his faith against him. So they got the king to, to, uh, to issue a royal decree. They challenged him to issue this royal decree, one that could not be altered because of the laws. And the decree should say that anyone in the kingdom who prays to any other god or human during the, the next 30 days it, it, who is not the king, that that person would be executed in a lion's den. So the king issues the decree. He declares that anyone who prays to a god other than the king, that that person would be executed. The king, king declares that anyone who prays to anyone other than him should be thrown into the lion's den. And what he didn't realize is that this decree was meant to trap Daniel and, so, uh, and to endanger Daniel's life. Uh, this, and Daniel was a good friend of the king's. And so, though Daniel knew, knows that it is contrary to the law of the kingdom, to, for him to pray and to ask petitions of God or man save for the king. He prays and he gives thanks to his God, the God of Israel. It is in the highest of sovereignty of the king of kings that Daniel believes and to the edicts of God's everlasting kingdom that Daniel yields fearlessly and unqualified obedience. It is God who will eventually deliver him. So what we can learn from Daniel today First, that Daniel's prayerfulness was the secret of his power. You see, Daniel was always a man of prayer, even as a young man. He knew how to lay hold of divine strength, and he became strong in the Lord. We are told that he went to the house to pray, and that Daniel was an important leader and had lots of official duties to perform. His everyday life was spent engaging in the various business dealings of his office and distributing the favors of the king, but he did not, did not pray within his office. He was in the habit of going to his house to pray, <laughs> finding it neither convenient to the circumstances nor congenial to pray in, in, amid a, a group of idolaters. Daniel chooses to set apart a chamber in his own home for his prayer. And there are some of us who never pray, uh, but uh, it, we never pray so well as when we pray in that favorite chair that we have or in that favorite room or that favorite place where we go to speak to God. There are many times when, when we pour out our grief to God, when we pour out all of our transgressions and we pour out those things and we do it better when we do it in a place where we are familiar with prayer. It's good to have a room or a place, no matter how humble, where we can shut the door and pray to our Father who art in heaven, who will hear and will answer our prayers. Daniel was in the habit of praying three times a day. Daniel would pray in the morning and in the evening and at noon, and he was an old man, probably about 90, when, uh, but he didn't mind the journeys back and forth to his home to pray, even though he was a busy man and, and he, he was regularly, uh, he regularly found time to devote to his prayer. 
Perhaps he thought that because he would, was, had so much work to do that he needed to pray even more. Martin Luther said at one time, he said, I have got so much to do today that I cannot possibly get through it in less than three hours of prayer. So perhaps Daniel also felt that the extraordinary pressure of his work demanded that he pr have a proportionate measure of prayer to the work that he had to, to do to accom accomplish. Daniel sought out counsel from God when he woke up. He sought out counsel at noon and at night. Three times a day he would go and he would pray and worship God. Daniel was in the habit of prayer with his window open towards Jerusalem. Praying with his window open had become natural for Daniel. So he continued to practice that even though he knew that it wasn't essential for his prayers. He refused to change that practice. And now that the decree had been signed, he knew that he and knew, he knew that he must not pray. Daniel would not only pray, but he would continue to pray even with the window open. The same indifference that he had to to whether others would hear it was was how he operated in his prayer. He, he went, left the window open and with a royal with royal courage, Daniel went to his, his room to pray often, three times a day. And he lifted his heart above the fear uh, of men that were out there trying to get him and raised his conscience above the suspicion of compromise. Daniel would not shut his window. He would continue to pray to God in the same way that he had for all these years. Daniel prayed with the window open so that he might face Jerusalem where the temple was being built at that very time. Even though Daniel could not go to the temple, he could look that way and be able to think about God. Daniel had remained faithful to, the, to his native Israel. He was a Jew first and foremost, and in the land of Babylon where he lived, he didn't care who knew that he was a member of the Jewish tribe. Daniel was not ashamed to be counted among the despised and the captive race of Israel there in Babylon, and he would keep his eye on the temple and the altar. So Daniel prayed with his window open. And when Daniel prayed, he mingled his prayer with thanksgiving. Daniel prayed and he gave thanks to God for all that he had. And I wonder if he sang a psalm during that time as well. Perhaps he did. At any rate, prayer and praise sweetly becomes his worship. And he could not ask for more grace without gratefully acknowledging what he had already received from God. We too need to mix thanksgiving in our prayers. I don't think we can thank God enough for all of the many things that God does for us. And we ought to do that habitually, just as Daniel did, asking God, as we ask God for things, we should also be there to thank God for the things we receive. Prayer and praise should always be sent up to heaven arm in arm, like twin angels moving up Jacob's ladder or like kindred desires soaring up to the Most High. The difficulty was that Daniel was a man of prayer, but now with this decree, Daniel was not to pray to his God ever, but rather to the king. But only one course was open to Daniel. He knew what that was and he knew what it was he had to do. Daniel was doing what Paul talks about in Colossians 3, 23 and 24, when he says, whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing that you will receive the war reward of the inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. It may be hard for us to imagine being Daniel. Suppose the law of the land were that each one of us could not pray, but we, uh, for the remainder of the month, or uh, or pain, uh, the the pain, the cost would be that we were tr were tossed into a den of lions. How many of us would continue to pray? I think that there would be a rather sparse number of prayer meetings after that point. What if there were informers everywhere and they were watching everyone's every move and they would be there to, to, to tattle and to tell on anyone who bowed their head or got to their knee at night, morning, or noon? How many would it be, how many of us would continue to pray? How many of us would quickly say, well, I'll give it all up? There, there, there would also perhaps be those who would be like Daniel and who would say, I will not give it up. I will continue to pray to my God. With, with bold resolve, we would continue to pray. 
If we tremble at suffering for Christ and evade his cross, we may have to encounter a fiercer doom than the terror from which in our craven panic we shrunk. It may be hard going forward, but it is worse going back. It's a great privilege that we enjoy such civil and, and re religious liberties in the United States, that we are not under such cruel laws as in other times or in other countries who have laid restrictions upon conscience and that we may, that we may pray according to the convictions of our judgment and the desires of our heart. But even we though should value this privilege Suppose there was only one place in the world where a person might go to pray and, and to offer supplication to God. I think that there would be many who would be like, uh, would be trying to get to that place uh, to, to be able to get there uh, only if, even if that meant that they were to die there. Oh, what pains we would take to, to reach that place, what pressure we would endure to get to that one place where we could enter the house and speak to God. If there were only one house of prayer in the world and the prayer could be heard nowhere else, oh, what tugging and squeezing and toiling there would be to get into that one place. But here, where people may pray anywhere, how they, they slight the exercise and neglect it, the privilege of being able to pray to our God. Where we seek him, he is found, and every place is hallowed ground. Daniel knew that it was that it knew what it was that he had to do. He did not deliberate for even a single moment, but Daniel went to his house and prayed in the morning. He went to his house and prayed at noon, and he retired to his house and prayed in the evening. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a, a four times. I have great admiration for Daniel. You see, he did not alter his behavior, but continued to pray as he was accustomed. Without disguise or attempt to conceal, no precautions whatsoever, Daniel knew that he was a Jew, a worshiper of Jehovah, the God of the Hebrews, and that he needed to set an example for all the other Jews who were there in exile with him, who might have grace enough to stand up with an example that would lead the way. You must know this truth though, doing right doesn't mean everything will always go right. You see, Daniel would show that, that his conscience was obedient to God and that he owed no allegiance to man. Daniel saw the risk of being put in the lion's den as nothing compared to the risk of being put into Sheol. Daniel chose the lesser risk and in the name of God, he went straight into the lion's den, straight into the evil and they, that threatened him and he was put into the lion's den. Daniel went into the lion's den, but there was not a scratch on him when he came out of it. What a splendid night he must have had with those lions. It's no wonder in the days after he would see visions of lions and wild beasts. It seems only natural that he would, and he must have been fitted by the Lord and uh, for that night to see such grand sights. What a grand night with lions and angels to keep him company. And the next day when he came out, everyone looked upon him with awe. The king was not regarded as highly as, as was Daniel. And Daniel had a smooth time, uh, uh, Daniel had a smooth time at it, of it after that. No more people trying to trouble him or to get revenge on him or to plot against him. So till the end of his days, Daniel had smooth sailing in the port of peace. But you know what? We cannot expect to wake up one morning and have the, that Daniel kind of faith. When crisis comes and we have not been living for Christ, we're in trouble. We can't use God like we use the 911 call system. God can uh, come quick, there's an emergency, and then expect that he's going to come and solve our problems so that we can forget about him once again. This Daniel kind of faith requires a daily walk with God, a day in, day in, day out, faithfully serving, praying, and fellowshipping with God kind of relationship. Daniel established holy habits and didn't walk until the pressure was on, to, didn't wait till the pressure was on to spend his time with God. So may we be like Daniel. May the young among us rival the, the purpose of heart with which Daniel began his life. May the active and vigorous among us seek with Daniel's constant prayerfulness so richly endowed him. And may the embarrassed, the tempted, and the persecuted among us learn to keep a clean conscience and impure, and amid impurities as Daniel did. 
to preserve him, to preserve like him faith and fellowship with the faithful and true God, though we may live among strangers and foreigners, and to hold the statutes and commandments of the Lord as more to be desired than wealth or honor. Yes, dearer to us than even life itself. So that is the way we honor God and we glorify Christ, blessing and praising his precious name in a way in which nothing else but a decision of character can possibly lead us to do. May God grant us all to know Christ as our Savior and to live praising him and praying to him daily. This is Pastor Laura Cherry. May you go with God. Amen.